Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. Something I want to address immediately is how clickbaity the title is. I chose this for the reason that most people do, so more people click on the video. But the justification for this is that I'm hoping someone far smarter than I am clicks on this video and can put the ideas I'm going to talk about in a better form than I can. I feel like now is actually quite a good time to make a video about this. I've had the script around in part since summer of last year, but the topic of ARB being stagnant and unbalanced wasn't really enough of a talking point back then to merit a video of this size discussing it. Speaking of, this is probably going to end up being quite a long video, so I'm going to split it up into little chunks that you can watch in segments if you don't have the time to watch it all in one go. So, I imagine most War Thunder players who play or have played a lot of aerialistic battles have slowly gotten bored or frustrated with the mode over the years and might not be able to really work out when or why this happened. The reason for this, I feel, generally, is the combination of uninspired legacy mechanics, the annoyances and how the meta is effectively frozen due to no change in how the mode functions on a fundamental level, and really the lack of any new aircraft or mechanics to change it up a little bit. The little issues here have persisted for such a long time that the mode has effectively just become dull and repetitive for most people. Now, I have ideas to help the mode be great again, but thinking about that and saying it out loud makes me wonder if the mode was ever actually great to begin with, or maybe it just felt like it did because the glaring issues the mode had didn't really have a chance to annoy people yet. Getting shot down by AA is annoying the first time, but annoying enough to make you quit playing after the hundredth time. Before I start completely, I'd like to mention something about myself briefly. Prior to the last update, I had every single aircraft in the game spaded. That's bomber, attacker, heavy fighter, everything. I've experienced pretty much every playstyle the game has to offer, and in pretty much every situation as well. So, these ideas are coming from experience, and a deep care for the mode that brought me to playing this game all those years ago in the first place. So, with all that said, let's get to it. I really hope you enjoy. The only real problem with airfields is how the anti-air protection works, and it is quite a big issue. But this is actually the most common issue I've found when talking to people about why they don't like air battles anymore. So I won't be condescending and explain in detail why it's a broken feature, as everyone knows already. The issue generally comes from how the anti-air promotes a passive playstyle. So when in a disadvantageous position, an aircraft can just dive to the cover of his airfield, and if the pursuing aircraft follows, they're going to be shot down incredibly quickly, leaving the player using a passive playstyle the victor. This isn't a fair system because the player who is chasing the aircraft running to the airfield, who is trying to continue the engagement, is punished because the other player lost the advantage, and this is obviously the opposite of how a system like this should work. There is a way I think this could be a lot more fair though. I think that in a situation where two players are fighting over the runway, the anti-air should only kick in after a set amount of time, say maybe 30 seconds to a minute. This way, if the fleeing player is good at defensive flying and the pursuing player isn't, they'll be rewarded with the anti-air cover if they manage to stay alive while the enemy is behind them. This does have a basis in history too, as um, anti-air crews could not always immediately identify what aircraft are engaging over the airspace. You know, it could be a friendly, it might not, and they're probably not going to risk shooting at one of the aircraft before they can identify which one's which. So it does actually have some basis here. Anyway, this way, Anti-air cover actually requires effort to receive the advantage, which is the way something like this should work, and is vital to the mode being enjoyable. I also think that the AA cover should stop if an enemy plane flies away far enough to stop a player from camping their own airfield indefinitely in the cover of the AA. The timer should then re-engage if an enemy comes in range again. But the way it functions in game now, honestly at times, does seem like a placeholder from six years ago that Gaijin has forgot to change as the way it functions in a finished game just doesn't work. It should be a reward system of sorts. What I mean is um, that it's, it's essentially an ultimate weapon, as silly as that sounds. And one way I can explain this is likening it to the nuke slightly in Call of Duty. Uh, the nuke is a weapon that kills everyone on the enemy team automatically with no literal input from the player, uh, which is about 25 kills, which is a lot of effort in the game. So it has to be earned. So. Imagine if you could get that weapon just by hiding in a corner the whole match without actively trying to engage any of the other players and just being passive. 
The airfield in-game takes no effort to earn or use, so hopefully putting it into terms like that shows just how ridiculous a system like this is in its current state. Another issue surrounding airfields is players jaying out on the runway. Now this is a less common issue, so I'll explain it properly. When a player respawns on the runway after repair and rearming, they're invincible for around 10 seconds. So if an enemy is flying towards the runway to strafe them, the player on the runway can just jay out and remain invincible constantly just by periodically jaying in and out of their aircraft until the enemy aircraft trying to strafe them get shot down by the AA cover. Now a simple fix for this is just to make aircraft on the runway constantly physical and able to take damage while a player is in the menu or jumping in and out of the aircraft on the runway, allowing them to just be strafed and killed. Speaking of landing on the runway, this is where the AA should offer some constant cover. I feel that if a plane is landing, gear down, low speed, the airfield AA should activate to provide cover as the aircraft landing has no actual way of defending itself. Now, this anti-aircraft cover should remain the entire time the aircraft is actually repairing on the runway, and it should remain active for, say, another two minutes after the aircraft is actually able to take off, just so it has enough time to gain some altitude while it's still in a vulnerable state. And this does allow, I feel, enough time for the aircraft to get back into the flight on fair terms, and is also incentivized at the same time to get back into it quickly, as the anti-air cover only lasts so long, so it's going to speed the match up as well. So, in a world where these changes have taken effect, a scenario could go like this. Two aircraft are fighting. One gains the upper hand, and after a long engagement, the losing player goes back to base with the other in pursuit. While over the airfield, the planes re-engage in a dogfight for around a minute, and the pursuing aircraft flies off before the AA can take him out. The other then lands, rearms, and takes off, spiral climbing above his airfield to get altitude while in cover of the AA before it's deactivated. He then flies back to the other aircraft to reset the fight from before. And I really think this is the most fair this system can be. What do you think? Now, this is an idea that I haven't really heard been thrown around much, but it's one that I think can make matches a lot fairer. We've all had those matches where 80% of the team are in bombers and attackers, the remainder of the fighters on the team can't hold their own, and the attackers and bombers don't really win the match. This isn't fair on anyone in the team, really. Bombers don't get the cover, fighters don't get the group support they need, and it's a lose-lose situation. But I do have an idea that could stop this from happening, all the while increasing the effectiveness of bombers and attackers as well. I think there should be a set amount of each type of unit for each team, so hypothetically let's say there's 10 fighters of varying sub-roles and 8 bombers and attackers and 4 variables, and I'll get to those in a minute. I decided to combine bombers and attackers into a single slot, as some nations have a lot more bombers than attackers and vice versa. This way, every type of vehicle has enough strength in numbers to fill their role in the match. So, in some instances currently, a team could have only a single attacker, and sure, they can take out some units, but it would be near impossible to win the match by tickets that way. It just makes the attacker a wasted spot in the team for a fighter. The same with bombers. Now some of you are probably thinking, wait, this will probably hit queue times pretty hard, and it would. So, I think bombers and attackers should be able to join in progress, whether they have the option turned on or not, just so no one's really waiting for a long time. For this system to work though, some aircraft need some adjustment. And this is where the four variable options come in. Each team should have some slots to allocate to fighters or attackers respectively. And what I mean is that some aircraft like the Ki-109 can be used as a tank buster or interceptor, same with the 50mm variants of the ME-410, and these vehicles should be allowed versatility in the new system as well. Same with strike fighters like the P-47 with ordnance. This way, uh, a P-47 that goes ground pounding isn't taking up a slot on the team for a fighter. There are a few issues with this concept though in that what if six players join a match and want to play as an attacker despite being a strike fighter or a heavy fighter, so that leaves two players unable to play the match how they want to. How I'd say this could be fixed is that a player can equip their aircraft with ordnance or something similar in the hangar as an attack aircraft to enter the match that way, although it might complicate things, I'm not sure. There is a further problem with this however, and this is where I'd like you in the comments to come up with a better solution than I can. The problem lies with certain nations not having comparable amounts of attack aircraft. Germany, for example, have a lot of fighters, but not as many bombers or attackers at every tier, so this system would be unbalanced. 
how I'd fix this is by going in depth a little bit further and saying that maps should be balanced with this in mind. The German side of the map should have more targets to destroy than the Allied side, which you know makes sense as they are the defending force. To compensate for this, I think the German team should have more fighters than the other team to combat the bombers, which again is, relatively speaking, historical. This equalises the team by allowing the Germans to compensate for the large amount of enemy attack aircraft. This would generally lead to the German victory occurring from wiping out the enemy air force, while I imagine the Allies would win more from destroying the German ground positions. And this has been a slight trend in the current meta anyway for most instances. However, this is starting to get a bit too complicated again, so I don't really think the general player base would react well to it. I'm not really sure. Regarding that though, I'm not going to go any deeper into it as I don't really want this to be even more complicated than it already is. But all that aside, this system allows each team to start off strong. The attackers and bombers can do their jobs, the fighters have the safety in numbers and the versatility that they need to be as effective as possible. There's one more issue to mention before the next segment though, and that's some maps need to have objectives altered or added. Some of the Japanese maps for example have nothing for high altitude bombers to easily accomplish, so an easy fix for this would be adding bases on islands to bomb and fixing damage models for the ships so that guns on the attackers can actually do damage to them. Even the 75mm on the PBJ can't kill a cargo ship. So speaking of changes like that, let's get into some further map adjustment. Initially here I had a long segment about adding lots of different types of ground units and mechanics, uh, but from talking to others about it and showing the little segment I had around, I think it's a little bit overwhelming and generally quite unrealistic, so I'm going to simplify it a little bit. First of all, I think Gaijin will be reluctant to change the size of maps, but will be certainly less reluctant to add new units to existing maps, and I feel this is what we should really focus on. Before that though, I think tickets should be increased a lot. To compensate for this, of course, there should be a lot more units to kill on the ground that drain tickets, uh, tanks, pillboxes, bases, etc. The reason for this ultimately is so there's more targets for the large amount of bombers and attackers to kill while making sure the games don't end too quickly. I also think that some light ground units should be close to the attacker spawns to almost guarantee that they're going to take something out and at least earn some RP. As right now, it's not really fun to fly for 5 minutes in a slow heavy plane only to get jumped by an ultimately more powerful fighter that'll send you right back to the hangar before you can really do anything. Also, to compensate for the large amount of bombers present in the match, I do think that there should be a couple more bombing points as well. And speaking of that, I don't think the destruction of the airfield should end the match. As lots of other people have said before me, I think it should just disallow other aircraft to use it for repair. It should of course drain a lot of tickets when it's destroyed though. Now, I think this is quite a good thing, you know, it adds tension to the team who lost the airfield while also previously providing them an incentive to take out the bombers and not allow the destruction of the airfield to happen in the first place. I also think that bombers should be able to attack the airfield from the start of the match but have its HP buff to compensate. There are a few reasons for this. Some aircraft like the HE-177 can carry two 1500kg bombs on the wings but has to drop them first before the smaller bombs in the bomb bay. A single one of those 1500 bombs can destroy one of the smaller mini bases, and it's forced to drop them both at the same time, which is a massive waste for the player, especially when they need to pay more lions to use the loadout. The HE-177 is much better suited in this state to attack the airfield, and the player should have the opportunity to do it from the get-go. Attacking the airfield like this should comparatively give less points than it does now, but when it's destroyed should pay out the difference, so it's only really a viable option if all the bombers work together. If you think it's a bit much to destroy the airfield outright, which I can see good reasoning for, perhaps it would be better to allow the forward runway to be destroyed instead uh, of the main runway, as the forward runways on every single map are currently indestructible, which is a bit silly and doesn't really make much sense. It will be a good target for light and medium bombers as well. The last point about bombers here is something I'm a little bit conflicted on. From spading all the bombers in the game, notably the heavy bombers, I know how annoying and difficult it is to descend from your altitude, land and rearm to get more bombs. This is even more difficult considering you're probably damaged on top of this. Also, climb back to a safe altitude is nearly impossible because you're so heavy, and by that point in the match there's probably a lot of low fighters around the base that can take you out when you're slow and in the climb. 
Now, Gaijin trialled a system years ago in which heavy bombers could rearm in mid-air at the edge of the map. This is obviously really unrealistic, but it does fix a problem in gameplay, but doesn't really make much sense, at least for realism, as the reload happened mid-air while the bomber was invisible off the map. However, I do think that the suffering of heavy bombers rearming is worse than the mid-air reload option, so I'd say it would generally be a welcome addition. But so it isn't so easy, I'd say that the bombers should have to rally at a varying point on the map boundary on the allied side each time. The way this could be explained in the game's universe is that the bomber you're piloting is swapped out for a copy at the edge of the map. Your bomber flies off and you take control of another identical one for a small fee of silver lions. As, to be honest, a new bomber that's readily rearmed and at altitude should not be free. This would also, in my opinion, stop players from hiding their heavy bombers at altitude as they can just remain at their optimum combat altitude constantly and be continually effective. Next, back to the map itself. I think that Gaijin should add one more type of dynamic objective, factories. And this is something I think a lot of people have wanted in the game for quite a while. And this is what I'd say medium and light bombers should generally be going for. It would be dynamic in the sense that different parts of the factory would have different buildings to destroy all around the complex, and destroying it completely would again drain a lot of tickets. I've always loved this idea, and I think it would work pretty well in the game. A few attackers could head to the factory on the offset, loosen up the anti-air defences, that could even be an objective for them actually, and take out a few buildings and head back, leaving it an easier target for the other bombers to level. And this is the sort of thing I want to encourage, players helping each other fulfil their respective objectives. The next point I think the game misses out on is the objectives that the game gives for bombers, attackers and fighters, and they're generally way too vague. So take the screenshot of the German objectives for the map Berlin. Help the ground forces defend Blankenfeld. Help the ground forces to defend Grenau. Do not let the airfield be captured. Destroy all bomb targets. Only the latter one is clear. Destroy all the bases. To a new player, helping the ground forces doesn't actually mean anything. How do you do that? Or rather, how do you do that specifically? Which forces do you need to take out? Which forces do you need to defend? You can work it out, sure, but the game doesn't directly explain this. The objectives need to be a lot clearer. On the spawn screen with the map, it should highlight different patches of different units vaguely. There's a convoy of tanks over here somewhere, destroy it. There's a set of bunkers and pillboxes in this area, take them out. This way, a player can choose what they want to attack from the start and plan their route accordingly. Of course, a player can memorise where these units are roughly, so this wouldn't be necessary, but newer players don't really know what they're doing or where they're going. And in my opinion, War Thunder should be making their game as beginner-friendly as possible to keep all the players playing the game, as the player retention rate is I think less than 1% if I remember right. So at this point it is very, very important to keep as many players playing as they can, especially if a player likes playing attackers and they constantly get killed before they can even reach targets to take out. So, when a player is in the spawn screen with an attacker, there should be precise objectives for that attacker. Destroy a number of tank columns, destroy a cluster of light pillboxes and D9, so players know what they need to do and what their specific job is. With bombers it should be destroy factories, bases in these coordinates and airfields in these coordinates and have a mission objective for each one respectively that can be completed. Fighters and interceptors should get the briefing of defend bombers and intercept enemy bombers and fighters and heavy and air defence fighters should be briefed to defend attack aircraft or defend the fighters in their roles depending on what they've kitted their aircraft out for. There would be no hard penalty from deviating from these objectives so players can do what they want as dumbing down the gameplay to only allow for a handful of linear objectives to be completed would be a massive downgrade and in the state air RB is at the moment that's really not the direction you want to be going in. But there should be some incentives for aircraft to do what they're supposed to do. And speaking of specific roles... Now, I understand this is a little bit of a vague title. What I mean by this is increasing the importance of aircraft types and their own respective roles. Attackers, heavy bombers, medium bombers, fighters. The roles of these vehicles in the current model meld into each other somewhat. Medium and light bombers do the same job as attackers and heavy bombers. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but I don't think it's as engaging or as in-depth as it could be. 
This wouldn't have been a problem a few years ago, but down to how stale Air RB has become for a lot of players, it does need some depth to continue being fun and engaging. For the majority of the player base, aircraft have slowly just become accessories to tank matches, which is a massive shame. I'd like to introduce some incentives for vehicles to do what they're designed to do. Attackers attacking columns of vehicles and light static locations, light and medium bombers attacking fortified locations, clusters of pillboxes and such, while heavy bombers can destroy the mini bases or factories and airfields. The incentive I'd like to introduce here is that the RP a player can earn by attacking what they're designed to attack should be relative. An example being that heavy bombers would gain more RP comparatively for attacking a static base than an attacker or light bomber, and an attacker would gain more RP from destroying tanks than a fighter or heavy bomber would. The difference wouldn't be much, it wouldn't mean a heavy bomber would earn something like 40% RP for killing a ground unit, no, it would be more closer to something around 70 or 80%. It is a detriment to the team if a heavy bomber dives low from the start to destroy tanks or pillboxes, as it's not really effective and they'll likely rip or get jumped on before they can really do anything. Also attackers can just fill the role better in many ways. A 100kg bomb dropped from low altitude precisely from an attacker can take out a light pillbox. So can a 1000kg bomb dropped by a heavy bomber at altitude, but that bomb would have way more of an impact if it was dropped on an actual base, do you see what I mean? I also like the idea of high altitude fighters getting more RP for kills around friendly bombers they're covering, and interceptors getting more RP for killing bombers. But I think fighters would do more damage overall by flying around the map looking for other targets than sticking to a bomber that might even go unnoticed. Perhaps only a small increase in RP for killing a plane around a bomber would be better in this case, as something that's incentivized but not in any way a requirement. Now, going back to that variable slot that I mentioned earlier for aircraft that can fill different roles, like strike fighters and some heavy fighters, when the match starts and, say, a Wyvern pilot chooses to play as a complete strike fighter, their icon should change accordingly to the attacker icon, and they should then earn more RP for destroying ground targets and a little less for destroying other aircraft. This is to stop strike fighters from spawning in low, dropping their ordnance, and speeding their way towards other enemy attackers for an easy chance to take them out. I think at this point, some of you are probably thinking, Christ Oxia, this is bloody complex, and yes, it is complicated to be introduced in one big go. So, I think there are some ways this could be introduced to soften the load of information players will have to take to know what they're doing. There should be specific tutorials for every type of aircraft. This could trigger when a new player unlocks them, or an existing player tries to load into an RB battle with them for the first time after the change, with a lion or small eagle reward for completing them, as I know some players do not like tutorials, especially after they've been playing for a while. So, hypothetically, an attacker tutorial could go like this. The game would explain that X target is what you should be aiming for in the match. Vehicle convoys, pillboxes, anti-air installations, etc. And also that they'll earn more RP for completing these actions than they would if they use their limited precise ordnance to damage a base or something similar. For a heavy fighter, it could explain that you need to choose to play as an attacker or support fighter when you start the match, and make it clear how the RP you could earn would be lessened and increased respectively depending on what you chose to play as, same with Strike Fighters. I feel that this way it wouldn't be too overwhelming a change, as I can appreciate that ARB has remained basically the same since the start of War Thunder, and changing the meta so drastically after the years is going to have some backlash, which I do completely understand. I think that if this could work, it should be trialled in an event over a weekend or something to iron out all the potential issues and imbalances, so players aren't overwhelmed if the whole mode changes overnight. I want to finish up here by saying that I know these ideas aren't perfect, and in some cases far from it, but I've been reading and hearing so many complaints about how dull ARB has become, so I wanted to spark something in the community to take these ideas into account and improve on them in their own ways, as me being a single person can't be objectively right. So, if you have any ideas yourself or want to put your own down in the comments, please do so. I'd love to read through some ideas about this as a whole. And, as always, I really hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.